afternoon um, to the students and faculty of the Blavatnik School of Government, a big welcome, and to other visitors from across Oxford, and especially warm welcome to the Blavatnik <coughs> School of Government. Um, I'm delighted you're here uh, today to have this conversation with the Chief Minister of Penang. I believe he's the fourth ever Chief Minister of Penang. Um, um, he's a man who, having started his career in banking, um, then took the even better path of politics, um, and a man who's pursued his career in politics with real passion and conviction. Uh, one of the students of the school asked me earlier in the week, gosh, how many times did this man go to prison for his beliefs? Um, he certainly uh, has been detained for his beliefs a period he says he's put, he hopes, firmly behind him. Um, and perhaps you'll say more about this later. But as Chief Minister of Penang, um, the minister is particularly known for his competency, accountability, and transparency initiative. Do you say CAT? So the CAT initiative, um, and really doing some quite extraordinary things in politics in Penang. And it's about that that he's going to um, give us some preliminary comments this evening, and then there will be plenty of time for you to take up questions, including some of those that some of you have been asking me during, during the week about the choices and difficulties of, for, for any student in any part of the world undertaking a life in politics. So, Chief Minister, it is truly an honour and a pleasure to have you visit the school and come to speak to us. Thank you very much. A warm welcome to the minister. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Nairi Woods, uh, Dean of the Republic School of Government, Dadosri Nazir Tunraza, Chairman of CIMB Group, the two members of Malaysian Parliament who is present with us, uh, Mr Ngwe Ek and Dr Ong Ken Meng, the Penang State Financial Officer, Dr Mukta Bin Jaid, distinguished faculty members and um, guests who are present here at this uh, T.S. Eliot Lecture, Theatre at Merton College. Uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Woods. And um, it's an honour to be uh, at Merton College in Oxford University because I remember the last time I was here, that was two years back, 29th May 2013 just a few weeks after the 2013 general elections, when I was hosted by the Oxford University Malaysia Club. And um, this time, I have the honour of being hosted by the Blavatnik School of Government, thanks, of course, also to Dato Sri Nazir Tunraza. Now, having a short introduction <coughs> to this very new school in the hallowed halls of Oxford, I cannot help but be amazed by its many accomplishments since its establishment four years ago. Of course, uh, the first class of uh, Masters in Public Policy, MPP students, were admitted in 2012. And you have now grown to a cohort of 119 students from 55 countries, including two Malaysians. Uh, everyone is a minority or a majority. And during this short period, you have attracted a diverse group of world-class researchers, including Professor Sir Paul Collier, the author of Bottom Billion, Professor Winnie Yip, Director of Global Health Policy Programme here at Oxford, and of course, last but not least, Professor and Dean Nairi Woods, Dean of School, as well as expert in the areas of global economic governance and global development. MVP students are no doubt interested in not just learning about public policy, but also discerning for themselves the type of public policies which are effective in different con contexts. I'd like to share with you my experience as Chief Minister of Penang in the past seven years, and in particular, some thoughts of how we put in place an entrepreneurial state in order to achieve the status of a high-income economy through inclusive growth. 
and I shall, appro I shall approach this from an angle of good governance, dynamic smart economy that is sustainable and collaborative, social inclusion, talents building, livability, and of course, the environment. Just a short introduction of Penang, second smallest state in Malaysia, land size of only 1,048 square kilometres, population of 1.7 million, no natural resources, but abundant human talent, and which has allowed us to progress to achieve a high income economy status through good governance, rule of law, integrity and leadership, and as mentioned, available human talent. I just like to put a caveat there. Because uh, when I mentioned Penang has a high income economy, based on the World Economic Forum Human Capital Report, defined as GDP per capita of 12,467 US dollars. Now, based on the previous exchange rate at that time, 40,841 ringgit, that was 2014. And we were supposed to achieve high income economy status this year with a per capita GDP per capita of 42,251, which exceeds the 40,841 ringgit benchmark. But that was based on the old exchange rate. <coughs> on the new exchange rate of 4.4, the benchmark will be not 41,000, it will be 50,000 ringgit. So our efforts will be for nothing. <laughs> Except we hope that when the ringgit recovers, hopefully by next year, then we can still say that we have achieved high income economic status in 2015. Um, of course, based on that, uh, what we describe as a more fairer exchange rate, rate value for the ringgit, uh, Penang will be a veritably a high income economy through inclu inclusive growth. Now, I'd just like to go to discuss uh, the entrepreneurial state that is associated with Professor Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who is now one of the key advisors of Jeremy Corbyn. And I mention her because uh, we are quite attracted by her primary argument for wealth creating agenda based on collaboration amongst wealth creators, which she described not just business alone, but also workers, public institutions, and civil society organizations. She made a strong proposition that the state can lead the way in investing in risky areas, especially in R&D, innovation, as well as retraining and upskilling, which the private sector would sometimes not touch. This is a strong counterpoint to the current mainstream thinking that those who govern best govern least and let the private sector do its job. Now in Penang, we are shaping a progressive economic policy that is investment-led, inclusive, and sustainable to create wealth through a public-private partnership that drives long-term growth and productivity. In many respects, Penang is an entrepreneurial state, except that we do not believe in becoming involved in market outcomes, especially competing with business in accordance with our mantra that the business of government is not to get into business. In Penang has an entrepreneurial state we see ourselves providing a catalytic role in providing public goods and services, basic communications infrastructure, and spurring the development of key risk, risky industries. But in other areas, especially where the private sector has a proven track record, the role of government is to reinvent government and leave business to the private sector. I'd just like to share with you an example where this works, not only to our surprise, but of course, to many people too. Now, those who have visited Penang will be familiar with Penang as one of the Silicon Valleys of the East, a rich, diverse culture and proud people who, who is hospitable and friendly. A, tribal, a thriving electronics and electrical industry, and of course, the best street food in the world. <laughs> but very few of you would think of fish farming when you think of Penang. And I think it would surprise you to learn that this fish farming industry grew from basically nothing in 2008 when we first took power to what is now a 1.2 billion ringgit industry. 
you got to divide by 6.5 under the new exchange rate when you talk about ringgit. So I will not be converting to the pound because I do not know what is the value of the pound now. Vis a vis a ringgit. Just divide by around 6.5. From nothing seven years ago, we have created a 1.2 billion ringgit industry. And much as well, I would love to claim credit like all politicians do. This amazing transformation was done without a single penny being spent by the Penang State Government. Previously, the government would benefit its cronies by giving, by giving thousands of hectares of sea land to one or two individuals who would then sublet it to genuine operators under the classic rentier system. This is described by some as predatory capitalism. Now, we stopped this crony capitalistic practice and decided to give permits only to owner-operated fish farms to a maximum of 8,000 square meters each. Rental was fixed at 3,600 ringgit annually. Furthermore, we instituted a checklist system where approval must be given if all the boxes were ticked. And of course, the outcome of approval must be given within three months. And once this was implemented, there were so many applications that we now have 315 fish farms, a billion ringgit farm industry born out of nothing at all, basically export driven. Now, this is not rocket science. This is putting into practice the principle of cat governance, of competency, accountability and transparency, where we enable the fish farm industry by giving them licenses to operate and only to genuine owner operators, we empowered them by making the permit approval process more transparent and accountable. And the result was the enrichment of these farm, fish farm operators and their employee, employees, as well as the state government. Now, this is just one of the benefits of reinventing government. But Penang is much more than just fish farms. We are Malaysia's most industrialized state with 95% with of our GDP derived from manufacturing and services. Even though we are a small state making up only 5.5% of Malaysia's population and less than 0.5% of its land mass, we punch above our weight by contributing 7.4% to the country's GDP, 7% of total port container traffic and 12.3% of foreign tourist arrivals. Penang also contributes 22% of Malaysia's balance of trade surplus last year. Our economic growth for Penang is expected to be 6.2% this year, despite the challenges of the present economic downturn. Penang has long been part of the network of global cities. We were established in the 18th century as a trading port by the British, and today we remain an open economy and a favourite destination for foreign investors. From 2008 to 2014, we managed to achieve nearly 50 billion ringgit in terms of investments, which is of course nearly double what was achieved on a similar seven-year period, seven period. With over four decades of electronic products industrial experience, we would like to showcase some successful, successful examples of multinational corporations in Penang, such as Intel, running one of their global R&D hubs in Penang with over 2,000 local engineers just doing pure research and development. Citibank, based their global credit transaction services in Penang, and they have they conduct transactions with an annual value of 7.2 trillion US dollars. We are also the main medical tourism hub in Malaysia and houses the regional headquarters for B. Brown, the giant German medical device company. One of the reasons why we are able to punch above our weight is our human capital. They are the key drivers for much of our economy, especially in the services sector and also in the high value added manufacturing sector. But human capital is a highly scarce resource in Penang because our unemployment rate is the lowest in the country 
and also the lowest in Malaysian history at 1.2%. Despite a net migration rate, worker shortages are one of our main concerns. Despite our low unemployment rate, however, the major employers in the state are, cons are complaining about not having the workers with the right kinds of skills and aptitude. Now, to address this problem, my government recently launched a sponsorship agreement with the German Chamber of Commerce in Malaysia, where we brought in German dual vocational training for the first time in Malaysia and in Penang. Those who are familiar with the German vocational training would know that this is a program that emphasizes teaching through on-the-job training. A truly unique program in the Malaysian context. The Penang State Government sponsored the fees of these students. At the same time, they obtained a monthly stipend of the minimum wage of 900 ringgit from participating companies. In other words, they are paid to study. We believe that this is necessary to build up upskilling as well as retooling the experience of these workers so that we can have better depth of human talent. Developing human capital does not only happen in university classrooms or in the workspace. The best brains in the world needs to be stimulated, challenged and nurtured from the earlier stage. And we have, we have done that through the establishment of the Penang Science Cluster Initiative. Again, in collaboration with the private sector to establish Penang as a centre of excellence for science and technology by creating a science-based culture to inspire and encourage innovative thinking, especially amongst the young. We have organised the largest international science fair in Malaysia, so huge that it has to be held in a sports stadium. This annual programme attracts 60 to 70,000 people. We have also taught kids robotics, in, again, in cooperation with the private sector. The one big difference compared to other government initiatives is after providing seed money and helping to lead the scientific initiative, we will then withdraw and allow the private sector to sponsor and run it compatible with the industry needs of the skill sets, skill sets and the type of technology required. Through these unique partnerships and collaborations, a new generation of scientists and innovators can be enabled. Companies, both large and small, can be empowered to reach deep into the talent pool. And students and employers, of course, can be enriched. The area of human capital development is one where the state can play an entrepreneurial role. Technical and vocational education and training have been largely ignored by the private higher education sector because it is seen to be unprofitable and there is no market amongst fee-paying students for these programs. That's why in Penang, we have to invest in education if we are to win the future. And of course, we are sponsoring the fees of these students. Ideas for good governance and progressive policies are not created by mere accident. Inputs are needed from various stakeholders, practitioners, public officials, civil society agents and think tanks. Any progressive agenda only succeeds if the policy ideas work. We have established a think tank, Penang Institute, headed by Dr. Lim Kim Wah from Cambridge University, that explores new ideas of how to make them work. We are also working with international organisations, such as the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, to introduce community-based urban regeneration projects which have changed the landscape of Georgetown, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Today, tourists throng the streets of Georgetown, soaking up the unique architectural and cultural landscape in East and Southeast Asia without parallel reasons for award according to UNESCO. In this, the state government plays a role of enabling the heritage city to give the tech startups an additional boost, we have converted 
the heritage buildings has accelerators. Combining the new with the old, the ancient with the modern. Our accelerator programs hopes to accelerate tech startups by implying the three new fields of big data analytics, cloud computing, and Internet of Things. And whilst we are not expecting any returns from the 20 million ringgit investment, we are confident that we can create new synergies in the future for new and existing industries. I believe that all these initiatives are important to provide an inclusive growth platform for those who are talented in this creative sector. No doubt, Penang has many hidden talents, such as Jimmy Chu, the world-renowned shoe designer, who is a local Penang boy. However, whilst talent is universal, opportunity is not. We try to match talent with opportunity. To succeed, a government must grant freedom. Not just freedom of expression, but freedom of equal opportunity, freedom to be the best they want to be, and freedom to realize their potential. And of course, freedom from undue interference from the government. Freedom works in Penang, and it's one of the key elements how a small economy can harness the energy, expertise, and entrepreneurship of our people. And the only way to escape the middle income trap is through innovation, investing in education, and rules-based institutions. In Penang, we have the three T's of establishing creative clusters with talent, technology, and tolerance of new ideas. In a fast-growing economy like Penang, the government must always be aware that there will inevitably be those who fall between the cracks and do not enjoy the full benefits of a competitive marketplace. As part of our plan to eliminate hardcore poverty, my government has put in place an income top-up scheme that will give families whose total earnings are below the poverty line indicator of 790 ringgit per month a top-up payment of between 100 to 790 ringgit every month. With this move, hardcore poverty has been effectively eliminated in Penang. However, we are aware of the unintended consequence of cash handouts as it cultivates a dependency culture. And most importantly, it does not break the cycle of poverty. Therefore, we are ending unconditional cash transfers and transitioning towards conditional cash transfers, whereby those receiving aid from the state must also ensure their children are in good health, getting the right vaccinations, attending schools and achieving improved grades. Ladies and gentlemen, to have inclusive growth, we must also ensure sustainable growth to the environment. The state government has promoted recycling and is the first state in Malaysia to ban the distribution and use of free plastic bags. As of 2014, Penang has already reached a recycling rate of 32.8%, which is the highest in Malaysia. By 2020, we aim to achieve 40%, which is twice the national target of 20%. We also intend to lay dedicated bicycle lanes throughout the state to make Malaysia the first bicycle state in, to make Penang the first bicycle state in Malaysia. As you may have guessed, our economic success, our livability factors, and our care to the society have attracted many to Penang. Land is scarce, housing is expensive, and we have set aside a public fund of up to 1 billion ringgit to build affordable housing in the state. To pay for these programs, we auction off government land to the highest bidder. And by doing so, we are praised by the Auditor General reports every year and singled out by Transparency International for our transparent, open tender government procurement system. Now, we could afford to pay for many of these progressive schemes aimed at the bottom 40% because we were able to improve government finances significantly. Our cash reserves have increased by 50%. Our debt 
has been reduced by 90%. And from 2008 to 2013, we have recorded annual surpluses every year. We spend 12% of our annual budget on socially inclusive programs, including cash handouts. And furthermore, the low unemployment rate is translated, is translated to households in Penang enjoying household income growth of 7.6% annually between 2012 and 2014. As a result of these progressive policies, our Gini coefficient has been reduced from 0 0.42 in 2009 to 0 0.37 in 2012, an improvement of 11% over three years. Whilst Penang's Gini coefficient is better than Malaysia's rate of 0 0.42, we still have some way to go before we reach international standards. Penang has consistently been rated as one of the most livable cities in Asia, number eight in Asia, according to ECA International, and of course, the most livable in Malaysia. We have the best street food in the world. We have a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Georgetown. We are committed to making Penang the first bicycle and green state in Malaysia and route to being the premier destination to invest, to learn, work, play and eat. The present debt crisis have shown that income inequality cannot be solved by free markets. Free markets are said to be better than the state in provision of goods and services except a pro-market rule of law. However, investment in public goods such as infrastructure, basic social services, research and development, innovative technologies can only be done by the entrepreneurial state, provided that the state exit at the earliest opportune moment to prevent undue interference. We are still learning to grapple about when to exit so as not to throw good money after bad or divert resources for other worthwhile ventures. Now, I tried to paint vignettes of how the Penang's development is based on certain principles that are based on good governance and transparent decision-making, which enables them with skills and education, empowers with rights and responsibilities, and enriches the people by sharing in economic wealth. Whilst we are focused on providing a better life for our voters, we realise that we can only win the future by investing in education. Whilst embracing the challenges of globalisation, we will not shy away from preparing the young for the future, as well as prepare the future for the young. I hope that in the course of your MPP programme, you'll get a taste of what it's like to be involved in public policy, perhaps through your summer internship programmes, in a tangible manner. I would like to invite to see for yourself what we have done in Penang. Thank you and good luck. like that, I think the faculty of the school should be allowed to do summer projects in Penang as well. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, to your questions. I'm going to take a cluster of questions so you can get a sense of the range of things that people are, are um, interested in. Um, but who would like to be bold and brave and kick off? Yes, Susan. Uh, we have a microphone we coming. We have one, I'm afraid. Good evening and thank you, Honorable Chief Minister, for addressing us. My question is, do you fear that uh, after you, the system would crumble? Or uh, let me put it more constructively, that what are your steps to institutionalize the reforms that you have brought into Penang in terms of an open tender system, in terms of uh, competency, accountability, and transparency? What have been your steps to institutionalize this? in the political culture of Penang. Thank you. Great. Let me take another couple of questions. Yes. Um, can you just pass the microphone across to the middle? Okay. My name is uh, Francis Cooley. 
and I'm from Liberia, West Africa. Um, I'd just like to follow up on the, the issue of uh, indigenous people's rights in Pinaj. Uh, anything like that, because I didn't hear you measure that uh, in terms of uh, laying a property right. Uh, because normally when you have uh, such a large scale private sector investment, uh, in many instances, the rights of indigenous communities sometimes come under attack or are violated. Mm -hmm. So any issue about indigenous people's rights, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions in this round? Uh, right, right, sorry, right at the back. Thank you, sir. I'm Satendra from India. So you talked of lack of natural resources <coughs> in Penang. Now in the world we have two spectra. People with natural resources like petroleum are the richest countries. And the people with natural resources like minerals in Africa are the poorest countries. How do you think lack of natural resources was boon or bane for Penang to develop? I, I want to throw in a personal um, question. Um, you said that you, you, know, you, you managed to stop crony capitalism. That was clearly an important thing. And just this afternoon, I was meeting with some students, and an American student said to me, I want to go into politics, but I would have to raise at least $10 million to go into politics. So what hope have I got to be a politician who's not representing special interests? I think it's a global problem for pretty much every country. And it'd be just very interesting to hear your reflections on, you know, what, what would you have advised this young student um, before or after or during? Or what would you advise others from, from very different countries about how you negotiate, you know, sp special interests? But we've, you've got a, a range of questions there. We'd love your, we'd love your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll take your question first, Professor. Uh, when you talk about chronic capitalism, um, somehow it's a vicious cycle because uh, the system feeds itself. Mm -hmm. Now, if you need 10 million just to get yourself elected, I will ask that gentleman to give up mm -hmm. on politics. <laughs> because if I need 10 million to be elected as Chief Minister of Penang, I will not be where I am now. Mm -hmm. It will be just impossible. And the reason uh, that we won in 2008 was because the previous batch of leaders performed so badly mm -hmm. that they just, want to <laughs> they just want to throw the whole lot out. No, we were as shocked as they were when we won power. And we were completely unprepared. Uh, we had no experience, uh, we had no expectations. But when the previous lot was so corrupt, we knew we could do better. Because uh, you know, any clean government would perform better than a corrupt government. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have no experience, but we have no experience in stealing people's money too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not too bad when you are starting afresh. Uh, so, can, can well, Crony, yeah, but... Can I just pick up yeah. on that? Because some, some of the people in this room are one day going to find themselves in political power with no experience <laughs> and honesty. Um, <laughs> So what would you advise them on getting, who did you turn to who was most useful? When you had to make decisions about which you knew you, you, you didn't know enough, you had no expertise, no experience, who did you turn to that was the most useful? So it was a very steep learning curve. And when you are new, you don't know who you can trust. Mm -hmm. Especially when you inherited a civil service from the previous government. Yes. So for the first year, I was very deliberative and careful in making decisions. It was perhaps a bit slower, mm -hmm. but no, I had to master my brief, so to say, for that one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we only start making quick decisions after one year. Right. So I was reading everything I could get my hands on, mm -hmm. because you do not know whether you are shortchanged or whether you're getting the right advice. Right. So to be frank, you can trust uh, some of the experts, but finally you have to have the know-how to make the right decision, mm -hmm. hopefully the right decision. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, a bad decision is better than no decision at all. That's, uh, well, that's one. Uh, but again, I emphasize that uh, if you need 10 million just to win the election, uh, good luck. <laughs> Natural resource curse, boon or bane. Um, I think this, this is an issue that has also uh, embroiled many economists into controversies. Uh, the Dutch curse after they discovered oil. And why is it that many of the Orish countries uh, perform so badly in terms of human development? But on, on the other end of the spectrum, you look at Norway. Mm -hmm. I think it's a success story mm -hmm. on how they uh, use oil to ensure the prosperity of their future generation. But unless you have a trained or a, a, a competent human resource, uh, I would think that having too much oil would be a win because once the oil runs out, you are in trouble, unless you are Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. where you can keep on discovering new oil fields every time. For an economy like Penang, if we discover oil, it better be huge or else it's going to wreck our economy. The first thing that we will find is that the ringgit will go up very fast and you kill the manufacturing industry because the terms of trade will not be in their favour and they, will, they can, just cannot compete. So it is a double-edged sword. It's how you manage uh, that double-edged sword. And I would think that the right model to follow would be Norway. They have um, top companies and at the same time, they have that huge oil reserves which they have invested what was that called? The Norway... Um, the sovereign Front. Yeah, the Sovereign Front. What was it? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, Nor the Norway Sovereign Front. Uh, from Liberia about... Indigenous rights. Indigenous people's rights. I think they are protected by our federal constitution. But there's no point in protecting indigenous rights if they don't have economic dignity. You must allow them to enjoy economic dignity. And that means, of course, you must reduce income inequality. And for my government, that is a primary concern. We have read that we have reduced our Gini coefficient from 0 0.42 to 0 0.37 in three years. But we can still do much more. So we, if you look at indigenous rights, I think it's very important to uplift them economically. And, uh, as well as uh, to make sure that they are able to depend on themselves to do so by being trained, by giving them, giving them the right educational tools. Because if you just give cash handouts, that dependency syndrome will, in, at the end of the day, destroy them. So what, what do you think that you're doing in Penang that most reduces inequality? First, we help the hardcore poor in terms of cash handouts. Uh, and we are making it conditional that they must mm -hmm. make sure that they are healthy, they send their children to school, and make sure that they provide food on the table. Mm -hmm. That's why we've recently implemented a new rule that we try to give these cash handouts to the women, mm -hmm. not to the men. Because women are more reliable in looking after the families. Mm -hmm. I know this sounds sexist, but it's a fact. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to put my hand out. No, <laughs> <laughs> um. no and also education. We must try to educate girls. Yeah. Give them every educational opportunity. You, you educate a man, you educate an individual. You educate a woman, you educate a family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our focus is always on women. Mm -hmm. If you uplift the economic welfare of women, I think you can reduce income inequality. Our focus again, in talk, when you talk about improving indigenous rights or improving the rights of the uh, lower income groups, is always on economic upliftment. Mm -hmm. And that is best achieved through ensuring they have full access to economic opportunities. Finally, uh, would the system crumble if we are not around? I would like to think that the system is uh, dependent on me, that I'm indispensable. <laughs> but you know in life, no person, no single person is indispensable. And I would like 
my greatest legacy to be that these institutions we have put in place would continue. And I believe it will continue. Because once you give the people a taste of freedom, you try to snatch it away, it's not so easy anymore. And in Penang, they have tasted that freedom. But are there some specific things? I think the question was, are there some specific things you can do to ensure that whoever comes after you will, will, will do a good job? First, open tenders. Mm -hmm. They just cannot scrap open tenders anymore mm -hmm. because it is part of the government procurement system. Number two, public declaration of assets. I declare my assets publicly. Mm -hmm. All members of my government declare, public, declare publicly their assets. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, we have banned also government leaders, uh, banned their families from doing business with government. Mm -hmm. So to avoid any possible conflict of interest. And finally, of course, land policies. Land is a premium asset in Penang. It's more valuable than gold because of land scarcity. Government leaders are banned from applying for government land. Mm -hmm. If you want to apply for government land, resign. Be a commoner. Then you can apply for government land. And we have also implemented a policy that where we give automatic renewal of leases for those land which have expired. I don't know whether you have a torrent system here. Mm -hmm. uh, ours follow the Australian torrent system. Right. So you have a certain lease period. Yeah. And when it's expired, normally you revert back to the government. Mm -hmm. Now in Penang, we have given automatic extensions. Right. And even though you need to pay the land premium, we, give it, we, we will give a substantial discount. Mm -hmm. Not 10%, but 90% discount. Mm -hmm. So you only pay 10% of the market value. That's very interesting. That list of four covers quite a lot of the ways in which we see governments or government officials enriching themselves in other parts of the world. So, that's so, a very so just to add on, you know, if, if we implement such policies, mm -hmm. any government that comes in, if they want to win an election, any political party, they have to promise that these policies will be continued mm -hmm. or else they will never win the elections. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why that we hope that that institutions will continue. Excellent. Thank you very much. Other questions? Yes, Alice. Uh, my name is Alice and I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I'm very impressed to hear about uh, everything that you've done uh, in your state, especially in terms of transparency and good governance. And from what we're, we've been hearing on the news, it doesn't seem that the central government of Malaysia <laughs> fares as well in terms of transparency and good governance. So my question is, I guess, um, how much influence does the central government have on your ability to run the state? And do you think that your success uh, is because of uh, you have a sort of a decentralized uh, power uh, system? Thank you. Well, uh, unfortunately, the federal government is almost uh, omnipotent as far as federal and state relations are concerned. Uh, the state government has only powers only two on two matters. One is on land, the other is on local government. That means approval for building permits. Mm -hmm. These are only the two areas where the state government has powers on. On all other areas such as health, education, public transport, they are all under the auspices of the federal government. So we have managed to achieve these successes, including tax, yes, and it's very important. They exercise full taxation control. Mm -hmm. So we pay around 6.3 billion ringgit in taxes. I get back only 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. Yes. So 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 2%. 
and human talent is the new oil of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. If you can get an uh, available talent pool, a deep talent pool, investors will come in mm -hmm. because they will search where the talent resides. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to build a deep pool of human talent using this finite resource. Excellent. I'm going to take uh, three or four questions. So let's take this one and then the one at the back. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Rob from Australia. Uh, just to try and get a bit more of a, a rounded picture, slightly provocative question, but uh, what would your well-intentioned, and I say that advisedly, what would your well-intentioned critics say about the approach that you're taking? And uh, what would you say in response to them? All my critics are not well-intentioned. <laughs> well, well, let me, well, let me answer that. Uh, I would feel that uh, they probably run out of ideas. Because in 2008, when we, uh, when we first won power, we had a popular mandate of 58%. In the last general elections in 2013, we increased our popular support by 10% to 68%. And that is the highest mandate in history. I think this is a testimony that uh, we are still coming out with uh, ideas to not only stimulate the economy, but to embrace the people, to make sure that they are not left out. I mentioned just now enabling the people with uh, skills, with education, empowering them with rights and responsibilities, and, enrich and enriching them so that they can have a share of the economic fruits of success. But I think that has worked so far. But I think Rob's question is if the 32% that didn't vote for you were in the room, what would they be asking you? You're asking <laughs> whether they can probably get more, <laughs> which we'll try to, of course, offer. But you, you, you cannot satisfy everyone. Mm -hmm. You just try, you just got to plug on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, at the same time, we see our role not only in satisfying the 68% or the 32%, we are also looking out for their children. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's most difficult for government because it's very easy to satisfy your voters, mm -hmm. but it's most difficult to satisfy their unborn children. Mm -hmm. And we believe that if we do not think about the future, we do not think about the unborn children, we have no future, especially when you don't have any natural resource. So sometimes you have to make choices which they are not happy. That's why there is that 32%. Is there something, though, that you're, you would particularly like to be doing that you can't? It's a trade-off that you've had to make, but if you didn't have to make the trade-off, you, you would prefer to be doing? A thousand and one things. A thousand and one. A thousand and one things. But is there one that particularly is close to your heart that you, that you wish you could do, but you, you just can't? Education. Mm -hmm. Because education is a federal um, jurisdiction. Uh, what we are doing is only at the margins, trying to provide remedial um, corrective measures. You know, we spend 23% of our national budget on education, and we don't get the results we deserve. Uh, we used to be among the leading nations in Southeast Asia in science and technology. But now we lose not just to Singapore, or Hong Kong, or Taiwan, or South Korea. We even lose out to Thailand and Vietnam in terms of science and maths for young kids. And that's a disgrace. <laughs> With due respect to everyone from Thailand and Vietnam in the room, they might now be part of the 32%. <laughs> and, 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 and what I want to stress is this. I don't think Vietnam and Thailand spends 23% of our national budget. I'm not talking about Penang's budget. 23% of their national budget on education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what have we done wrong? Mm -hmm. And why is it that we are still losing out in terms of quality, in quality, in terms of uh, employable graduates? Mm -hmm. The problem is now you have graduates, but are they employable? Right. Now, our challenge is to make them employable. Mm -hmm. Our challenge is to make sure that uh, companies want them. And that's why we have this vocational training. And we brought in the best in the world, German vocational education. Mm -hmm. And we are willing to invest in these efforts. Yeah. At the back. 
Thank you very much for fascinating insights. If we just shift to the uh, economic side uh, for a bit, uh, Ringgit hit 17-year-old uh, lows. Uh, oil is tanking. Fed is just about to hike. Do you anticipate uh, a new financial crisis like as in 1997? And more applicable to your region, uh, what kind of uh, global economic policies uh, you plan or you've maybe already put in place uh, in order to address uh, these challenges, which of course are partially exogenous, but uh, also uh, partially on the back of the uh, economic state in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. And do introduce your, yourselves and where you're from so that the minister can understand that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, just quick. If not too late, uh, my name is Jure. I'm from yeah. Croatia and I'm doing a DPhil in political economy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, you want to answer that? I'm not. I'm going to take three right. questions. Uh, could we pass the microphone yeah. just right along that row? Hi, Chief Minister. Um, hi, it's very, um, as a Penang citizen, I think it's very heartening to be in the audience of your presentation. Um, and I think I'd like to thank you for sharing uh, the Penang story, despite, as you said, being so constrained by the federal government. Um, and I think I ask this on behalf of the Malaysians in the house as well. Um, I think Malaysia is in a very interesting time. Uh, there's a lot of um, yearnings for change. And um, as a would-be first-time voter uh, of the general election in the coming few years, I think I'd just like to ask you for your general view of where the, the, the country as a whole is heading. And um, I hope you would also not shy away from the controversial issues of, you know, like education quotas or, um, you know, racial issues, um, affirmative action policies, and the likes. And, um, give us your clean thoughts on how you think Malaysia can truly become a highly developed country going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And can you pass the microphone right very back? That's right. Hello. Uh, I'm Surya. I'm from India. Uh, your description of economic development in, in Penang uh, reminds me of my small state, the small state from which I come. It's Kerala. So the, in economic parlance, it's known as the Kerala model of development where the development again was driven by the human resources. So if you see the economic indicators and the human indicators of Kerala, which is far ahead of the rest of India. So I'm seeing the same picture in Penang vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Malaysia. So basically my question is about your background, like you've been a banker, then came to politics. So here, many of us are from public sector, from private sector. So we debate over which is what is good, what is bad. So what is your take on it? Like how much, uh, like what is your, uh, what do you think about the private sector? What's good about it, bad about it? And what's your perception about public sector? How you compare and contrast these two since you have seen both the sides of it? And so do you mean in terms of sort of career advice? Like uh, It's about your experience mm -hmm. and the culture of working, how the, the input output, mm -hmm. all those aspects of it. Mm -hmm. The ethical aspect also involved. Great. And then if you pass the microphone right to the front. Um, Honourable uh, CM, I'm Kuratulen. I'm a civil servant from Pakistan, and I'm really interested um, in knowing that you have mentioned that you inherited a civil service from the previous government and you had to read all the documents yourself for a very long time. So are there any um, uh, reforms, particular reforms that you undertook, and what were the ones that were most effective, and was there any resistance, and how did you uh, cope with that resistance? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, right. Four questions at one go. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I take the last question first? Um, if you want to transform uh, a state or a country or any economy, you got to make sure that the civil service is with you. If you want to transform, let's say for instance, Penang to be an international intelligence city, your civil service, civil service must be intelligent as well as internationally benchmarked because they are your implementers. 
So, uh, in Penang, uh, we face that huge challenge of a hostile civil service in the beginning. So, we had to go and differentiate well, the good guys from the bad guys. That takes time. But most important of all, I think you must show that you are honest. You must show that you are clean. You must show that you are incorruptible. And once you can prove that, the civil service will learn to respect you. But that is not enough. You need the carrot and stick approach. Reward the performers. Punish the legats, including termination. And I have done a couple of that during the seven years. So once you can get that done, then when the service, civil service works in concert with your our policies, then as I said just now, you can make your ideas work. These policies translated on the ground can make things happen. And I cited an example just now, how, how we grew the fish farm industry from practically zero to a 1.2 billion ringgit industry, making or breeding fishes out of nothing at all. And we didn't spend a single cent. So who says reinventing government is a myth? It is not a myth. You can create an industry out of nothing. We have done that in Penang. Come and see, come and come to Penang and see for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not a bad idea. Uh, I would like to thank that lady from Kerala who asked me about uh, the, my perspective because I was once a banker. Actually, I was once an accountant. But because I went to prison, I lost my accreditation. And, <laughs> and my imprisonment had nothing to do with accounting or public uh, or private or moral culpability. I was sentenced to prison because I was just against the government. I was uh, trying to defend a young girl who was raped. And instead of, of arresting the rapist, they arrested the rape victim. And when I spoke out for her, I was myself detained. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I couldn't get my accreditation renewed. So, uh, you know, I don't have a very good impression of the private sector. But then again, you need the private sector to be the engine of economic growth. Despite all its ills, its faults and its defects, it is still the most efficient mechanism to drive an economy forward. Creativity, innovation, disruptive technology, automation are all driven by the private sector, never by the public sector. What we need is a strong public sector to ensure that the rule of law is enforced. And that is where you need to strike the balance. Probably I've got, well, a little bit more experience coming from the private sector and now be in the centre of the public sector. But I've never, uh, I've never, what do you call, uh, deceived myself that the public sector can do everything. That is not true. In my experience, you need the private sector to make things work because the public sector has a tendency to block everything that one tries to do. So start something, take the initiative, put in seed money, after that withdraw, don't interfere. And then you see, as what uh, we always say, you see a hundred flowers bloom from that effort. C can I just pick up what you... You, you, your mention of speaking out in defence of this young rape victim, because it is so important um, in public life to speak out sometimes, but at others, the cost outweighs the benefit. And I just wondered what your reflection is on that. When, when you look back, do you, are, you, are you still glad that you spoke out, or do you feel that with hindsight, there was a more effective way to change the status quo? I think this was one of those uh, inflection points where I think the people of Malaysia realised that, uh, that racism was just a myth perpetrated by those who want to hang on to power. Because this rape victim 
was uh, an, an underage Malay girl. Uh, even though she consented, but it's still statutory rape because she was below 16. And when she was detained, no one wanted to help her because her rapists were allegedly very influential. Her grandmother was an Ill illiterate old lady. She brought up the granddaughter. And when the granddaughter was detained, since no one wanted to help her, she heard that I was the only one who could do so. So she, she searched for me for two days in the city because she didn't know where my office was. And finally, a kind gentleman brought her to my office. And when she told me her story in a very, uh, a very stilted Kampong Malay language, I understood her pain. And she couldn't express herself, but you could see that she just cannot understand why her granddaughter was raped and yet she was detained and she asked me for help. I couldn't turn her down because I knew if I did that, I would not be able to sleep. Mm -hmm. Just imagine if your daughter was in that mm -hmm. position. So I decided to help her and of course, I paid a price. I've never re regretted doing that. And perhaps uh, God in his... Uh, Boundless Mercy decided to let me be the chief minister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting. But you, know, you never know what uh, life takes you. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, just doing the right thing and um, being true to yourself. So I, I, I would not say that I've, been, I've done all the right thing all the time. But, uh, you try to get the major issues right. Mm -hmm. And that is what, when you talk about fighting corruption. You know, I like to think that fighting corruption is not, doing, not only doing the right thing when everyone is looking, but doing the right thing when no one is looking. Mm -hmm. I think then you will have said that you have succeeded in fighting corruption. In all honesty, I can say, I never took money or bribes when no one was looking. <laughs> I think that is the most important. Mm -hmm. Can I go to the last question? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there are, some, there are two more questions actually. I'll take the first question first because I think the last question is on political crisis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, financial crisis and political the, crisis. The economic crisis. By that gentleman at the back. Um, are we facing an economic crisis or will we be facing an economic crisis? And that, oh, that was a question with the declining oil prices and uh, uh, the fall, the precipitous fall of the ringgit. Will we, will we be facing an economic crisis? I would say that actually we are in the midst of an economic crisis now in Malaysia. Uh, ringgit falling to historic lows of 4.4 to the dollar. Uh, there's the economic downturn. Um, well, for Penang, at least the manufacturing sector is holding up because we are an export, we are an export economy. But tourism uh, has suffered somewhat. Um, the only um, hotel that is doing well is ENO, owned by Dato Sri Terry Tam here. Uh, but I think apart from that hotel, most of hotels have recorded uh, declining hotel occupancy. I, I think this symptom of the regional uh, economic uh, pressures, because not only Malaysia's currency have dropped, I think every currency in the region has dropped. But unfortunately, Malaysian currency has dropped much more because of the current political crisis. And that political crisis is caused by <laughs> well, our leaders. <laughs> now, how do, you, how do you resolve that? Now, we feel that it is not just the person alone. It is also the system. Now, the system needs a complete overhaul. Unfortunately, anyone that tries to overhaul or to do the right thing is being punished. The Attorney General has been removed. The 
Bank Negara Governor is now being vilified. Uh, people who make reports have been arrested and detained. Lawyers acting for clients are also detained and arrested. Uh, it's safer to be in London than in Kuala Lumpur. You know? <laughs> but having said that, do not lose hope. Uh, they, of course, there are many policies that uh, need to be looked at to ensure that it really benefits the people. For instance, you mentioned about uh, racial quotas. It should not be packaged as racial quotas. It should be packaged as economic quotas to help the poor. And it's a fact that the majority of the poor are Malays. If these quotas, economic quotas, designed to help the poor, is effective, no one will grudge that. No one will oppose that. The only problem is there is too much crony capitalism, there's too much corruption, and there's too much manipulation of public assets. Uh, when I was here, I, was, I just read the news that there, has, there will be toll hikes beginning tomorrow. It's a travesty of justice. Why do I say that? Because these companies, most of them, have already got back their capital investment. Penang Bridge, for instance, they got back their capital investment 10 years ago. And yet, they are collecting toll until 2038. Pure profit. Doesn't make sense. Why doesn't the government nationalise it? Have a one-off nationalisation programme? And then they can reap the profits. Of course, we feel that they refuse to do so because of cronies, because the cronies are a cronies own these companies. And that is part of the problem. When you have corruption, endemic corruption, those who want to avoid answering questions, hard questions, they cannot answer them, they use race, they use extremism to try to divert attention. That's why in the recent Bursay rallies, where we asked for a clean and full accountability. It was turned into a racial event. We do not deny that the majority of those who participated in the birthday rallies, up to 500,000, the majority of them were not Malays. But there were more than 100,000 Malays who attended the rallies. How can it be turned into a non-Malay rally or a Chinese rally? Even the former Prime Minister attended the rally. Are we saying that Tun Dr. Mahathir is not a Malay but a Chinese? But that is the impression that is given, purely to divert attention. I don't think Malaysians will stand for this. Malaysians are not so gullible to fall for such tricks. At the end of the day, I think they will know that how to do the right thing. I still have faith in Malaysians. And we should have faith. Just look at me. If you tell, told me in 2007 that I'll be the next Chief Minister of Penang, I say you're mad. Start raving mad. I wouldn't believe it myself. But here I am, seven years later, still the Chief Minister of Penang. Something that would be deemed impossible eight years ago is, is now a fact. And I think we have come that far. Change is possible, and I believe it will happen at the next general elections, if not sooner. Well, Mr. Lim Guan Eng, the Right Honourable Chief Minister, it's been a total privilege to hear from you today. And thank you for your frank and direct answers and your inspiration. Thank you. So, a huge round of applause for our speaker.